Hi, nice to see you all. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, this Silius Con is taking place finally. Uh, I was waiting for such an event for, for a long, long time, and I'm very really glad that uh, there is so much interest in Silius and the community is still developing. So before we go, uh, before I start with my presentation, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, so I'm Conrad Alfaro, and uh, I'm originated as a developer. Uh, so I have more, of, more than eight years of uh, backend experience with multiple applications, multiple businesses, and uh, architectures. And a uh, couple of years back, uh, when I was working on some e-commerce project in some company, I encountered this project called uh, Silius. Maybe you have heard about it. And uh, I immediately fell in love with Silius. Uh, it looked great, it had a lot of great features, and uh, it was beautifully crafted. Like the uh, code quality is, was and is still uh, really, really amazing. So uh, I was also fortunate to be part of the Silius team, as Wukash mentioned. And uh, yeah, I was the part of Silius team as well. Uh, but uh, our ways split it, but my journey with uh, Silius has not. And uh, right now I am a CEO and founder of uh, Eight Lines, which is a software agency working on top of Silius, but also other technologies like uh, Headless Solutions, Next.js, uh, and many, many others. Uh, we also do a lot of software consultancy, so if you are having some problems with your legacy PHP project, yeah, we are the guys. Yeah, but uh, enough about me, let's go with the presentation. And uh, before we start, I would like to uh, make some statement, make a small thesis that uh, I will continue and I will need further in my presentation. So, Silius is great for small projects. And that's, of course, a lie. Because Silius, even though it has a great ecosystem and it is very easy to start with Silius, especially right now when we have great documentation, we have uh, great test coverage and uh, BDD, which Mateusz mentioned earlier, uh, it uh, covers a lot of uh, code, and uh, yeah, it's great for, uh, to see the implemented features, and uh, also uh, enables us to be sure that the code uh, is very stable. The, uh, the Silius itself is very stable. Uh, we also have GitHub, uh, where the community is also contributing to Silius, which is great because not only Silius core team is working on new features, but also you, the community. And speaking about communities, it was also mentioned, but great Slack community is also enabling everyone to enter Silius ecosystem very easily. And uh, yeah, one more thing for developers especially, we have Docker finally, which works great even on Macs and every other devices. It's great and easy. And finally, we have Symfony which we have talked a, a lot uh, this morning. But uh, yeah, Symfony is great because it, it is a very stable and mature framework, and Silius is based on top of it, which is a great combination. So how hard can it be to work with Silius then? Well, there are some obstacles on the way. And in my opinion, the problem is the symphony way. Uh, why would you ask? Well, over the years, I worked with many Silius projects, and most of them looked like this. So if you don't see the whole details of the slide, don't worry. I will tell you what's on, uh, on, the, uh, on the slide. So we have the basic project structure with uh, SRC directory opened. And as you can see, it is a long list of files. And I can tell you that there are files like entities, uh, uh, sorry, namespaces like entities, menus, order, uh, resources, repositories, and so on and so on. So a lot of 
stru like structure that is looking similarly to symphony recommendations. But is it uh, easy to read? Is it easy to work with? Well, I don't think so. Let me tell you why. Uh, first of all, it is hard to see the implemented features. So when you work with such a project, with such a flat structure of directories and namespaces, it is very hard to see where the given feature is implemented. And to show you the example, we can see that uh, this is the recommendation of Symfony uh, from best practices. And I don't tell you that this is bad. This is, of course, good for some of the projects. But when you start to think, where would you put some custom logic or uh, implementation of a given feature, you would start to think that maybe it should be here, 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 or anywhere. There's nothing about it, uh, or very little in Symfony documentation, where to put such things. And because most of developers follow the base practices from Symfony, we don't think about features and contexts. That's why this is problematic. Also, the second thing, uh, poor maintainability. So when you don't see easily where the given feature is implemented, it is very hard to find it and extend it or change. Also, we are very coupled with the framework because we embrace the structure of Symfony recommendations and we are following it. Uh, so we are coupling with, with the framework even more. And moreover, we have no contexts. So it is also connected to lack of the features, uh, of the preview of the features we have in our system. We can't see which uh, class or uh, service is for what context. And in Cilius, we have at least two contexts, right? The context of the shop and the context of the admin. So it's also uh, a problem. So are we lost? Uh, is this the problem we cannot overcome? Well, there are some solutions. And uh, for example, it can be domain-driven design. But uh, yeah, is it really the solution? Well, I don't think so. Because as with everything, it depends. Uh, Domain-driven design is a great approach. When you want to work better with your business site and uh, learn more about the domain you are implementing, especially when the domain is starting to be more and more complex. But usually, uh, it is uh, good enough to follow the Symfony best practices. So what's, uh, what proposal I, I would like to tell you is to embrace just some concepts from domain-driven and think more about features you implement in your e-commerce uh, than standard, f than just following the Symfony and uh, Silius extension uh, documentation. So, uh, how Silius should be used then? Uh, well, let's first take a look what is Silius in our puzzle. When we take a look uh, at uh, the placement of Silius uh, in our systems, it is usually not working alone. It is talking to many different systems, uh, external systems like uh, product information management, like ERP, CRMs, uh, many, many of other external systems that are uh, taking data from Silius or sending data to Silius. Also, Silius is usually not providing just the uh, front end of, the, of your shop, but you are integrating your shop with many other clients, right? So how I like to depict uh, how Silius should be 
uh, used is more like a gateway, an e-commerce gateway between your external systems and your end clients. Let's take a look. Yeah, so Sidious is uh, underneath uh, communicating with other systems because it has great architecture. Sidious itself has great architecture which can embrace and uh, align with uh, and integrate with many other external systems dedicated to products, customers, and so on. And thanks to recent API platform, uh, we have uh, the ability and the agility to integrate as uh, many clients as possible. Uh, so we are not uh, coupled with the uh, HTML UI. We can integrate our UI on phones, web, even on fridges if you want, right? Okay, but uh, there's one thing. Because I mentioned that, yeah, everything should be like uh, pass through the Silius, and Silius should s serve a unified API to the clients for the e commerce experience. But uh, on my graph, the CMS is standing like next and uh, communicating directly with the front end. Why, should you, you would ask? Well, uh, in my opinion, front end delivers only the content for the clients. So it is, there is no necessity to integrate it with the e-commerce. The content itself can be just delivered to the clients directly. But this is just a side note. OK, uh, we established that Sidious is great as a gateway between your external systems and the clients. Let's see some example then, how can we uh, use Celius in a, a little bit, bit more, ele more elegant way. Uh, but, before, but before we uh, go to the example, I would like to uh, set up some scenario that uh, we will uh, use in our implementation. So the first thing is that we want to import uh, the products from PIM. And uh, yes, yeah, so we will implement a simple synchronization process that will use Silius and some other external system. Second thing, we want to have an additional property in our product. This is also a common use case because sometimes you want to have some additional property that you will use in like different processes on top of the product, Silius product. And uh, the two last points are to, that we want to remain flexible and compatible with Silius, and uh, we want to change something in our business logic in the future. And this is the point you probably everyone uh, encountered because, yeah, the changes are uh, almost constant. Let's take a look at the first point. So let's uh, import products from our PIM. And uh, before we go further, uh, I would like to tell you about PIM I discovered recently uh, that I think is great for such example. It is Ergonaut. And uh, I find it very good as a product information management system to integrate with. Uh, it has a lot of great features, and I don't want to, to mention all of them for you, but a uh, couple of them are very connected to Silius, like being API first and having uh, many integrations. That being said, uh, let's take a look how we will implement our synchronization process uh, with Ergonaut, between Ergonaut and Silius. And there will be examples. I will have to go there to, to my computer, so, but in just a second. Uh, before we go, I would like to establish what we will see. Uh, not to afraid to everyone and scare with the amount of the code. But uh, all the code will be available and surprisingly it works, so you will be able to clone the repository and play with it. But uh, yeah, before we go uh, with uh, uh, with the demo, uh, 
I would like to explain why uh, the SRC directory looks how it looks. So uh, when you see uh, my SRC example, uh, you will see that we have three main directories, three, name, uh, three main namespaces. And those namespaces are contexts for me. Uh, and uh, we created some admin context for admin operations and admin extensions. And we created an offer context that will serve us as a product context. And the third one is the shared context, which is basically a technical stuff, but so we don't have to worry about it. Let's focus on the uh, two contexts above. And uh, yeah, one more thing. Um, why is it called offer? Um, well, uh, I recently s uh, en encountered this discussion on Silius uh, GitHub uh, about changing the naming of products into offers. And I find it really, really cool uh, this concept that e-commerce is not serving as products but offers, uh, I think solves also many like uh, problems with understanding uh, about uh, e-commerce implementations. I strongly encourage you to read this thread. Uh, I will link uh, everything at the end. Uh, but yeah, it is really cool and I strongly encourage you to read it. But uh, nothing stops me from using this concept right now, so I used it in my example. Why not? Uh, let's take a look what's inside of the offer context. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we like to take some, I like to take some uh, domain-driven uh, design concepts and use it in my applications because Sometimes domain-driven design is not applicable everywhere, but concepts are universal. And when we take a look, um, but for those of, uh, those of you who don't know what domain-driven design is, uh, let me tell you briefly about the layers we will see in the example. So the first one is the, we should consider, is the user interface layer. The user interface e layer is uh, all about accepting incoming uh, requests, actions, uh, any other uh, events that are coming from the outside world. Uh, and this layer is communicating just with the application layer. In order to do something, in order to synchronize products, in order to, I don't know, create a new offer, we will refer to the application layer. Because this is the layer that manages and contains all our application uh, logic and mechanisms. Yeah, but speaking about logic, uh, the logic itself uh, should be also and can be also implemented into the domain directory, into our domain. It is not necessary to have it. Uh, I don't think it is necessary because, well, sometimes there will, uh, there will be some people that will argue with you why there are no aggregates and why there are no entities and so on and so on. But I like this structure because domain suggests me that inside of it there are some business rules that will be, uh, that are implemented directly from the business and we will have a very nice uh, place, uh, easy to find, where we can see where, are, where is our domain logic. And finally, we have for us today the most important directory, the most important namespace, which is infrastructure. And inside of it, we have a uh, couple of directories. But uh, they are not, uh, and in previous examples, like in the application layer, inside of the application layer, we have the uh, uh, directories that are referring to features. So inside of the application layer, we have the synchronization feature and visualization feature. But inside of our infrastructure directory, we have something different. We have uh, divided the infrastructure layer 
into vendors. So uh, we, will s we have a clear vision of where we are using Cilius, where we are connecting with Cilius, with Ergonaut, or any other uh, external system or library. Okay, uh, enough about uh, domain-driven design and concepts and so on. Let me show you how can we use it. And for this, I will have to go there, but yeah, hopefully you will see everything. Okay, um, so if we take a look into our offer context and uh, the synchronization uh, feature folder, we will find to, uh, a command, some usual stuff for CQRS, so commands, command handlers, and other uh, nice services. So if we take a look into our command, which is um, just a request ID and source, which will uh, like be the, uh, the name of the uh, external system we want to take the data from. Uh, when we take a look into our uh, synchronization command handler, we will see that we are using some external product repository uh, uh, from which we are getting all the uh, products or offers uh, since some date. Uh, and this repository is an interface. This interface uh, is nothing much than implemented in the infrastructure layer. So if we take a look now where we are in our project, so as you can see, we now from the in sy synchronization product command, uh, products command handler, we went to the infrastructure. And that's great about this approach because the synchronization process doesn't have to know about the details of the GraphQL, of Ergonaut, or any other external API. So if we take a look uh, into the implementation of this uh, repository, we will see it's like just a query to GraphQL and we are wrapping this, the response from GraphQL, into some view objects. Those view objects, as we will see in our directories, are also the part of our synchronization feature. So we are still decoupled. So we are uh, wrapping the data from GraphQL or any other source into our view objects that are uh, un uh, unrelated to any uh, of those external services. And uh, let's get back to our synchronization process. Because we fetched the products from not uh, specified external provider, right? So uh, we are uh, not caring here about the, uh, whether it is Ergonaut or something else. And here we are throwing uh, iterating over all the products we fetched and uh, executing a new order to create a new offer. And of course, it has some flaws. Don't take this example like the book example uh, and follow it blindly. There is a still a place for uh, many improvements like throwing events instead of uh, next command, uh, using query buses instead of repositories, and so on. But uh, let's not focus here on that. Let's focus on creating the new offer. If we take a look uh, into this uh, simple command, uh, it currently accepts only the SKU. So uh, for now, we want to create a product with just an SKU. If we take a look inside uh, the command handler of it. Yeah, some notifications, okay. Uh, this is the process of our synchronization and it's also not coupled with any of the frameworks, even here. So the synchronization, uh, I tried to show you not the easiest examples, so I implemented here some uh, like logic of the synchronization. And let's say uh, from the external source, we will get some products that are um, like every, all products from the external source. But for now, our synchronization process supports only uh, shoes and clothes SKUs. So for, for any other, we should throw some exception. And uh, 
if we now take a look what's going on when we accept the shoe uh, product, uh, we will see that this is a simple service. Uh, I put it here because there can be a lot of other logic that can take place, but for now, here it is only just in some offer creator. This offer creator, like everything I'm talking about right now, is still in the application uh, layer in the synchronization feature folder. And if we take a look inside the creator, we will see that it is an interface. And this interface is implemented by no other than Silius. So if we take a look where we are now, we are again in the infrastructure directory, but now not in Ergonode, but in Silius, where we keep all our inter interactions with Silius uh, here. Okay. Uh, Let's get back to our presentation. Hopefully. Ah, I will have to get back in a second. Lukasz, don't go. <laughs> uh, yeah, but now uh, we will... Uh, so I showed you how we can implement our synchronization process. Now I would like you to show you how we can implement external uh, or new properties in our products. And uh, for this, we can refer to our lovely uh, Silius documentation, where you will probably find, if you have in mind, okay, I have to add some property to our product, right? And uh, it's, you may think that, okay, maybe let's add it to the same table as products, maybe add it uh, to the model of products uh, from Silius. You may think it's a good idea, and in some cases it is, but in some cases it is not. Uh, and if you go to this uh, Silius documentation, you will find this paragraph, how to customize your model. And uh, yeah, there are some examples, and uh, you can easily adjust. I mean, there is no example for products because there is a reason for that. But uh, you can, without much research, uh, start doing this by uh, like this. So by adding the field directly to the product itself in Silius. That's great, but it's a little bit sketchy because in Silius we have already a feature that is great for such things. We have product attributes. Product attributes can serve us uh, here and very good because we can add those custom flags, custom fields uh, using this built-in feature without extension of the, uh, of the model. Uh, but yeah, I will stop you here. Uh, it's not great, uh, it's not good for all the cases. And I would like to show you the case where we can go further and uh, also wrap the Silius, uh, yet being flexible. Uh, we must, uh, first we have to, before we start the implementation, we have always to ask ourselves questions to be sure what we are going to implement. And uh, the question I would like to ask myself is, is it really a product attribute? So in my imaginary scenario, we want to have the visualization for, I don't know, Metaverse, who is uh, no one using. But uh, uh, we want to have, the, have it in our products. And this visualization requires ID and token uh, for some reason. It would be good to add those two fields into the product model. But uh, I would like to show you the way where we don't extend the product model, yet implement this feature. And once again... Thank you, Lukasz. I should switch job and become the mic holder for my life. Okay, so uh, let's get back to our offer context and uh, application layer. We have yet another feature folder where we have the visualizations. 
And uh, if we uh, go inside the uh, command that is responsible for assigning visualization to the offer, we will see that it accepts some ID, token, and the SKU of the product that is going to have this visualization. And when we go inside of the handler that is un interpreting this uh, command, we will see two things. First of all, we have the product repository. And it's not the product repository from Silius yet. It is just an interface at that point, which is going to be implemented by Silius. So as you can see, we now went to the infrastructure layer. We are now uh, taking the Silius repository, uh, and we are returning it in our view object. Of course. Oh, great. Now I feel like a musician. Um, OK, uh, so let's get back to our uh, handler. Uh, once we've got the product, uh, which we wanted just for the ID, we can create our new entity. It can be, I don't know, domain aggregate, it can be domain entity, or just some entity. It doesn't matter. The most important thing is that we have separated Silius from our feature. And uh, yeah, the implementation here is not very interesting, but uh, he, this visualizations is also a repository. This repository is also not implemented in any of the layers like application or domain. It is implemented in the infrastructure by doctrine, because we want to have this visualization repository in our handled by our ORM. OK, uh, let's get back to presentation. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this. What about then remaining flexible and compatible with Silius? Well, from my experience and uh, by this example I showed you, I think we are uh, flexible and yet compatible with Silius because we are not extending it. We are using it just like any other external system, but uh, we are building our, our flows uh, decoupled from, from it. But you may ask, OK, what about the updates? What about the like, uh, maintenance? Of course, it is not a silver bullet. There will be problems. How, for example, the problems we encountered all during the uh, upgrade from 1.2 to 1.3, and uh, just the change from Symfony uh, 2 structure to Symfony 3 structure, 4 structure, right? Uh, it was not the most pleasant experience in many projects, but the examples I showed you are trying to help you at least have less problems with your custom logic, with adjusting your custom logic because it was so coupled with the framework that is changing over time, and that's great. So, are we compatible with uh, this fourth point? In my opinion, yes, because we have now a clear view where our features are implemented, and uh, we can easily change them and tell uh, some developer, OK, if you want to find the feature X, please go there. You will find it. You don't have to write any long documentations about, OK, it will be in the controller, which is using a service, which is using a repository, and so on and so on. So, as you can see, this approach, it is not a full domain-driven design. I'm not trying to sell you domain-driven design, but I'm trying to sell you the concepts from it, the concept of layering, the concept of infrastructure, and the concept of being decoupled from the tools we are using in our business applications. I like this tweet very much, even though it's not very popular, but uh, 
it's the reflection of my, of my thoughts. Uh, DDD sometimes is considered ha harmful because uh, many developers don't uh, understand it very well. It's because we, it's not about uh, the ORMs or the project structure. It's uh, about understanding the business. So if you want to use domain-driven design, it's a hell lot of a different story. But taking some concepts, you can do it like even tomorrow. So, is Silius good for small projects? Well, if you are actually working on a small project, you can follow Symfony recommendations, best practices. It is okay. But if your project starts to be more and more complex over time, maybe you should consider splitting the context, splitting the features into a more granular way, which will be easier for maintenance in the future. And uh, at the end, I wanted to tell you that, yeah, Silius is great, like every uh, other tool. But it depends on our perspective. So if we use Silius uh, just for a small project, it is great to follow the Symfony documentation. If we want to use Silius for something more complex and uh, want to use it just like a small piece in our big puzzle of many different systems and big architecture, maybe we should change our perspective and uh, thinking, way of thinking how we are working with, with it uh, in our project. That would be it from, from my side. Thank you very much for, for listening. Uh, as I promised, all the links from the presentation, the source code, the slides, the links that were mentioned in, the, uh, in here, and the small survey after, after the presentation is under this link. So yeah, please scan it. You can clone the repository. Uh, play with it. You can ask, find me also there and ask me any questions or here on SilusCon. Thank you.